Husky Stadium Reader Board eloquently describes the emotions felt by Husky fans this week as the Don James era concludes and the Jim Lambright era begins at the University of Washington. Hello, I'm Keith Shipman. To characterize the ride as interesting is a gross understatement. The events of the past 10 months have changed the face of intercollegiate athletics at the University of Washington forever. The big dog is, uh, is shot out of the sky. The chain of events began last November when Billy Joe Holbert revealed that he had accepted a loan of $50,000 from an Idaho businessman. It's frustrating because people think uh, that I've done something so evil. I haven't. I took out a loan. I screwed up on one detail. Uh, it wasn't minor. It was a big detail, but I, I screwed up on that. And uh, like I said, I take full responsibility for that action. The mistake Holbert made was accepting the loan against future earnings potential as well. After a seven-month investigation conducted by the Pac-10 and the university, 31 allegations of rules violations were brought against the Huskies. Washington admitted some of the violations took place, sought corrective action, they disputed others, and after nearly two months of duration, the conference announced the harshest sanctions ever handed to a member school. The Husky football program is placed on probation for two years, given a two-year ban on postseason bowl game appearances, stripped of ten scholarships to incoming players each of the next two years, Paid recruiting visits were reduced in half the first year by 40% the next. And the conference will take the Huskies television appearance money in 1993. We believe that the penalties leveled against this program are too harsh, unwarranted, based upon this case. The greatest shock came shortly after the Pac-10 announced its sanctions, when Don James said he would step down as head coach of the Huskies. I have decided that I can no longer coach conference that treats its members, its coaches, and their players so unfairly, therefore, effective immediately, I am retiring as the head football coach of the Washington Huskies. News of the dog father's retirement spread quickly. You had a great career, and uh, I'm very happy for all the things that you've done for me. It's just. Uh, a shame that things had to turn out the way they did. It's a shame for one to see a great coach like Don James' career end like that because, you know, he decided to hang up after that. Uh, I think there's no question that uh, the Pac-10 was far too severe on the, the penalty that they inflicted on Washington. I believe him to be an honest and uh, sincere coach and, and a man that has uh, built a, a great program on a lot of hard work. And uh, I just, uh, it isn't going to be the same, obviously, with him not uh, being at the helm of the Husky team. Don James came to Washington after four successful seasons at Kent State University. He accepted the job two days before Christmas 1974. At the end of his third season in Seattle, he was carried off the field after beating Michigan in the 1978 Rose Bowl. After a one-year hiatus from postseason play, his Huskies began a string of nine consecutive bowl appearances, a Pac-10 record. Four times during the 80s, his teams reached number one. The 1984 squad became the first Pac-10 team to compete in the Orange Bowl, and Washington stunned the football world by manhandling Oklahoma. In January of 1992, Don James reached the top when Washington won its first national championship. The Huskies defeated Michigan 34-14 in the Rose Bowl, completing a perfect 12-0 season. The next day, he collected the Coach's Poll Trophy, and following the season, he accepted the prestigious Bear Bryant Award, given to the National Coach of the Year. James' resiliency would be tested in 1992. Pressure mounted as the unbeaten streak ran to 22 games. He took a pounding at Oregon last year, a sideline collision which left him with a broken cheekbone. But in pure James style, he was back on the sideline the following week, requiring surgery to repair the painful injury. Don James' accomplishments will earn him a spot in the College Football Hall of Fame. He won almost 70% of his games in a 22-year coaching career at Kent and Washington. He's the Pac-10's winningest coach with 99 career conference victories. He led the Huskies to six Rose Bowls, 14 bowl games in all, during 18 years in Seattle. Don James' greatest contribution to the game is those he taught. California coach Keith Gilbertson is one of eight former assistants who've become head coaches. An original Husky staff member, Jim Mora, is now the head coach of the New Orleans Saints. 87 of his players have been drafted by NFL teams, the most notable, Emptman, who was the first pick by Indianapolis two years ago. News of his retirement hit players hard. I heard a lot of people talking outside while waiting that um, maybe as players we thought Coach James quit on us, and that's not true. I know for a fact 
that um, our coach, Coach James, would never do that. And none of the players down there or up here would think that. Coach James has been like a father image to all of us. And, um, and I want everybody to know that, you know, whoever went out and uh, took this man out of office, tomorrow morning I want to wake up, look at the mirror, and realize what they did. I visited with Coach James in his first on-camera interview and asked him if he's felt any regret since announcing his retirement. None whatsoever. We're, uh, I've used the word, we're at peace, and I never knew what that word meant, but uh, Colin and I and the family, we just, uh, we just feel like we've done exactly what we uh, had to do it under the circumstances. And uh, Sure, I didn't, I didn't want to give up my coaching career, but I've had a lot of good years. I've had a lot of great coaches to coach with and, and players to coach, and, uh, and, and my whole career has been blessed. At the, some fine institutions, and, uh, and, and I've, I've worked basically for about 40 years, and that's probably about long enough. The rest of our conversation with Don James is coming up on today's program. Barbara Hedge has introduced Jim Lambright as the new head coach of the Huskies Thursday with a four year, $600,000 contract. This is uh, extremely pleasing for me from the standpoint of uh, having a four year contract, uh, being able to carry that to the players and eventually uh, pass that on to the most critical part of, uh, of my program, which will be uh, maintaining an excellent recruiting approach. And we're pleased to welcome Jim Lambright to the Q13 family. We're looking forward to working with you, Jim, on Husky Highlights with Jim Lambright. Keith, I'm absolutely delighted to be here and looking forward to a great year. And uh, we're looking forward to talking a, a lot about the football team with you today. Let's talk about the circumstances, though, in which you uh, inherit this job. Obviously, you've been waiting a long time to be the head coach at the University of Washington, but we all know this is not the way you wanted to get the position. It didn't exactly follow the script uh, that was uh, in my head. Uh, a tremendous emotional down period uh, uh, with the penalty and uh, to the team and, and Don's leaving, uh, but now we're back on track and, and very ready to uh, attack the, the season to come. And looking at the positives, you've got a, a great coaching staff that's still in place, and you've got a good bunch of kids as well. Exactly, and that's the reason Don primarily made the move when he did uh, to put emphasis on the fact that he wants his team and staff to stay together and uh, direct what, uh, what he left. Plenty to talk about during today's program, and just ahead we're going to look at the offense. The $64,000 question is, who will quarterback the purple and gold? Well, not unlike the past three years, the quarterback spot has been hotly contested. Like Chandler and Conklin before them, Mark Burnell and Billy Joe Hobart have moved on to the greener pastures of the NFL, leaving a pair of untested quarterbacks behind. Husky fans have long waited for a glimpse of highly regarded Puyallup High product Damon Heward. He gave us a sneak preview of his talents late last season when he hooked up with Theron Hill for a 68-yard touchdown pass against Oregon State. I dropped down about 10 pounds. I wanted to get my body fat down just so I could be a little quicker on my feet. I feel uh, as if I'd done that, and I feel like I'm moving around a little bit better and uh, just, you know, watching a lot of film and uh, uh, understanding our offense completely inside and out. At 6'4", Heward is the prototype NFL quarterback with an arm that draws comparisons to Drew Bledsoe. He's the likely fan favorite, but don't count Eric Bjornsson out of the race for the starting spot. Bjornsson was recruited to Washington as a quarterback, played behind Brunel and Holbert at that position in 1991, even scored a touchdown in mop-up duty. When he saw the logjam at quarterback, he opted to become a receiver, where he excelled and lended depth the past two years. I'm starting to feel better. Uh, I felt pretty rusty in the spring as far as throwing the ball and making reads. I just felt like I was in slow motion, but uh, it's starting to come together, and, and you know, throwing a lot this summer helped and it's starting to become second nature. While Heward has worked on his foot speed, Bjornsson has worked on his release. Now the coaches must decide who will start and don't expect them to share duties. Due to the fact they're both limited experience-wise, I think you'd like to name a starter and get that player the majority of the experience. Uh, somewhere left down the road, though, you, you'd want to get the other some seasoning because, you know, you rarely do you make it through a season with one guy. Any good team, there's always going to be some kind of competition at every position. And, uh, you know, it's just a matter of... Uh, 
going out there and giving your best effort and doing all you can and hopefully that everything will work out. Now we try to look into all the other aspects too, leadership and, and moving the team, but you know decision making is probably the biggest key right now. Uh, they're both gifted enough to throw completions, but the one that makes the least amount of mistakes is probably the one that's going to be named a starter. Here's a look at what they've done statistically. Heward is a redshirt sophomore. He appeared in five games last year at quarterback, completed all five pass attempts, and was involved in the second longest pass play in the Pac-10. Bjornsson's numbers at quarterback are from 1991, when he appeared in seven games, including the Rose Bowl. He's a redshirt junior with plenty of game experience, a receiver. Well, ultimately, this decision, Jim, rests on your shoulders, but uh, Coach Woodruff described the process under which you go to, to find out who's going to be your starting quarterback. What's your thought as you get ready for this particular challenge? Well, number one, it's almost a, a blessing in disguise to have two quarterbacks that are contesting the battle, that are producing so well on the field at this moment. Uh, we feel real good about, uh, about Damon Heward and Eric Bjornsson. Uh, uh, have our fingers crossed that this is over into productivity against Stanford and uh, very honestly right now it is very very close as to which one will start. How do you plan to deal with the offense this year? Many people are interested in that particular uh, uh, facet given your experience on the other side of the ball. Um, it'll be my role to uh, on game day stand in between the offense and the defense and uh, and control the major decisions as to uh, to critical down and distance calls uh, but I feel so confident with Jeff Woodruff, who, uh, who led our team offensively last year. And basically, he and I will be agreeing on, uh, on most of the, the game plan offensively. Simple question, but a lot of folks are interested. Are you going to be wearing headsets when you're standing on the sideline? What are you going to be doing? I will wear headsets exactly the same as Don James wore them. It, uh, it's a matter of being able to switch offense to defense uh, when each of those are on the field. Well, one thing is certain, if healthy, the group of receivers that Heward and Bjornsson throw to this year maybe the fastest and perhaps the finest of the past decade. Jason Shelley finished the 1990 campaign with a 100-yard receiving effort in the Rose Bowl. After emerging as one of the country's top freshman receivers, he earned freshman All-America honors from USA Today. Though hampered by a bad ankle in fall camp, the sophomore from Vallejo, California, is expected to be 100% by the opener. Classmate Theron Hill was forced into action after a rash of injuries last year. Hill and Shelley have been tabbed the Wonder Twins by the Husky Publicity Department. Senior Joe Krolik is the veteran of the group. His scansic work ethic has drawn praise, and his reliable hands made him a favorite target of Hobart and Burdell the past two years. Since I've been here, it's, it's kind of been like the defense has kind of had to, ca not carry us, but really pull a lot of the load, okay? And because we've been so strong on defense, and now... We lost a lot of guys on defense, and now we have all the experience on offense, and I like that. I mean, it's time for us to pick it up and, you know, really uh, really pull some of the weight, and, that, you know, it's exciting for me. We have to think in terms of being able to complement our running game uh, that uh, uh, we, we got to be there and be open and catch the ball when called upon, but uh, I, don't, I don't think uh, it's, it's, we're not going to be a wholesale passing offense. Uh, I, I expect these kids to block as well as they catch. There is an element of uncertainty that is present any time a new quarterback steps forward. Damon been throwing the ball well, him and Eric, so uh, I think you'll see a lot more of that, a lot more. The only difference I see is the age. I mean, these guys are a little bit younger, less experienced, but uh, I got a lot of confidence in both of them. I think they both can get the job done. Two of the most explosive offensive players in America reside in the Husky backfield. The Huskies' leading rusher of a year ago, Napoleon Kaufman, will be flanked by the leader in 1991, Bino Bryant. Bryant is coming off a disappointing 92 campaign. He played in just two games due to a hamstring injury suffered during the preseason, then aggravated in the USC game. Bino was granted a fifth year of eligibility by the NCAA through an injury hardship. He spent the past eight months regaining his leg strength. Ran hills, a lot of hills, uh, valley runs, uh, backfield a lot. I walked backwards to different places to work the hamstring a lot. And uh, basically, I laid off, the, laid off the weights a little bit so that uh, I can concentrate on my running. The thought of Bryant and Kaufman in the same backfield is cause for excitement. Bryant has rushed for almost 1,400 yards during his Husky career and averaged almost six yards per carry when he led the team in rushing during the national championship season. Kaufman became the first Husky sophomore to rush for over 1,000 yards and set an all-time Husky record by averaging 6.5 yards per carry in a single season. His burst of speed earned him all Pac-10 first-team honors last year. 
and he's on several Heisman watch lists going into the 93 campaign. You can't say enough about the line. I mean, they're just they're doing a hell of a job. They're lifting weights and running. they're work, really working hard. So it looks like it's, it's going to be a, a great opportunity to have pile up some yards and uh, really get after some people in offense. And you really can't say enough about the guys who will block out of the backfield. Senior co-captain Matt Jones is back for his third season as a starter. Jones has averaged five yards a carry during his career in Washington and is an able receiver as well. Senior Leif Johnson will back Jones. He's also a notable special teams performer. Lincoln Kennedy received most of the attention among offensive linemen a year ago. He became the Atlanta Falcons' first-round draft pick. Though none are preseason all-conference selections, look for Washington's offensive line to move bodies. The line is anchored by senior Jim Nivelle. At 6'2", 280 pounds, he's one of the strongest players in Husky history. We have a lot of experience. We have a lot of strong guys up front. And if we can get it all together, good things could happen. Andrew Peterson, a junior from Port Orchard, returns at one guard spot. Frank Garcia started when Pete Caligas went on the shelf with a knee injury last year and has a full season of experience on the other side. Caligas has rehabilitated, though he watched running practices during two-a-days to give his knees a rest. The senior from Bellingham will see significant action in 1993. Puyallup's Tom Gallagher is back for his senior season with 11 starts under his belt. And Pete Pearson takes over for Kennedy, whom he backed up at the weak side tackle spot last year. Washington has two of college football's best receiving tight ends. Junior Mark Bruner started all 12 games last year and grabbed all Pac-10 honorable mention honors. He caught touchdown passes in each of the last two Rose Bowl games and has drawn praise from Don James for his blocking ability. Bruner is backed by sophomore Ernie Conwell from Kent. Expect to see more of him this season as Washington has plans to utilize more two tight end sets. Hopefully they're going to uh, utilize this a little more this year, and it looks like they're going to they're going to use a little bit more double tight in the, the package. And uh, you know, I, I like competing with Mark, and uh, but I feel like you know that I'm capable of doing the job as well, and I, I like to play. We got a lot of definite depth at all positions, and a lot of people with a good you know solid experience. So I think that's going to help us all. Next, we'll examine the defense, a group the head coach of the Huskies is intimately familiar with. Jim Lambright served terms as defensive coordinator under Jim Owens and Don James, and he'll remain in that role while assuming head coaching duties at the University of Washington. How do you plan to marry those two duties successfully, given the, the great responsibilities that are attached to both? Well, number one, uh, I will slide some of my, uh, my overseeing uh, duties to uh, Randy Hart and, uh, and Chris Tormey, my two defensive uh, cohorts have been with me for a long time. And, uh, and then we'll elevate uh, uh, the responsibilities of a graduate assistant coach, uh, Wayne Dickens, uh, to help me work with linebackers and allow me during team sections to, uh, to oversee the whole, the whole team. It's tough to carry on two full-time jobs, and that's basically what you're doing, isn't it? Well, in order to do it, you have to slide away a little bit, and, uh, and the way that I will, uh, I'll manage it will be just to, uh, to rely on extremely competent uh, friends to, uh, to take the defensive burden partly away from me. Well, let's have a look at a group that many consider to be the strength of the defense this year, the guys up front on the defensive line. The Huskies return only a handful of starters on the defense, and three of them are on the line. Co-captain Jamal Fontaine started 11 games a year ago and earned a reputation for his big hits. He knocked Stanford's Steve Stenstrom and USC's Rob Johnson out of games last year. I feel great about this group. This is an experienced group. Uh, the young guys that are in here have gotten a lot of exposure. They're all great athletes and uh, definitely wouldn't be there if they weren't able to play. And, uh, up front, we're solid, and the linebacking core, you know, they've been with me, and this is my fifth year, so we've all been together. I feel real, real secure about our team right now. We did lose a lot of quality guys on the defense, and uh, the D-line is definitely going to have to be a uh, inspiration and hopefully uh, be role model for the team because we do have some experience under our belt and I think we can do that. Hoffman is finally out of the shadow of his older brother David. Steve made his first of five starts against Stanford last year. DeMarco Farr took the place of Steve Entman on the defensive line last year and earned honorable mention all Pac-10 honors. He had ten tackles for loss, five of them sacks. 
the old dogs are gone, but you know, we have some young dogs that are ready to run and ready to, just as hungry and just as mean. So uh, we'll lose them as far as experience wise, but uh, I think uh, as far as physical talent, uh, we might even come up a little bit more. The greatest losses on defense were at linebacker, where All-America Dave Hoffman, James Clifford, and Jaime Fields graduated. It's a lot of differences. Um, we got a lot of guys that we um, lost and a lot of guys that uh, came up and, um, you know, really stepped up and filled the shoes of a lot of other guys. So um, I think everything's going to work out. Senior Hillary Butler will take over for Clifford at one inside backer spot. Butler has waited patiently for his turn as a regular, playing behind Chico Fraley and then Clifford. He was slowed by injury the first half of last season, but came on strong upon his return. Three-year letterman Steve Springstead gets his turn at the other inside backer spot. The senior from Lacey played in all but two games last year and missed most of spring practice for the knee injury. Junior Donovan Schmidt is another who has waited patiently for his chance to play. He saw action in every game last year. The most notable among the linebackers is senior co-captain Andy Mason. He was second only to Hoffman in tackles for loss last year and earned honorable mention all Pac-10 honors. Mason moves from his rush position to the weak side linebacker spot where he'll focus more on pass coverage. Coming back to a position where I originally started out, I've been uh, down rushing the pass the last few years and now it gives me the opportunity to drop back and do a little more coverage work and actually use my skills a little bit better. The departure of Shane Palakoa, Tommy Smith and Walter Bailey is sure to be felt in the secondary, but most who will step in have had considerable playing time. Josh Moore, a senior from Torrance, earned all Pac-10 honorable mention honors at cornerback last year. He led the Huskies in interceptions with four. He's the lone returning starter. Last year, you know, I was the baby of the group, but now, you know, if something goes wrong or if someone has any questions, they're going to come to me. And that's, you know, where I had to pick up on the mental aspect of the part of the game, and so I'd be able to have uh, answers for them. A lot of these guys, they've been waiting in the wings, waiting their turn to play, because, uh, uh, you know, like you said, you had Hoffman and Clifford and all those guys, but then you got Hillary Butler and back of him, he runs a 4-4, and, you know, he's one of the fastest uh, defenders on the team. Reeser was Washington's nickelback last season. He was the Huskies' top preserve, whose most celebrated action was in the Rose Bowl last year, where he filled in for an injured Walter Bick. Lamar Lyons backed up Palcoa at free safety the past two seasons. The junior from Los Angeles will finally get his shot. And David Kilpatrick takes over for Tommy Smith at Rover. He was named the most improved defensive back coming out of spring drills. Your, your feelings about the way this group is coming together this year, the chemistry. Uh, you've got an awful lot of uh, young guys in there who don't have as much experience as the units you've coached the past couple of years. Exactly. The, the loss of three starting linebackers and your, uh, your two starting safeties uh, right away brings uh, concern about leadership. Uh, they're, they're the ones that directed the, the football team uh, defensively. Uh, the young players uh, really aren't young. They're just new into starting roles, which... Uh, uh, helps me feel better about it. You take a couple of fifth-year seniors, uh, uh, Hillary Butler and, uh, and Steve Springstead, and add Andy Mason to that. Uh, there's, there's a lot of experience that uh, just have never started, and it kind of makes you relax a little bit. The defense uh, has carried this club the last few years. There's no question about that. And Joe Krolik said it might be time for the offense to step up and, and do the same thing while the defense nurtures itself along. Are, are you of that same opinion? I, I feel so strongly about uh, how good our offense can be, and it starts right with our offensive line, and, uh, uh, and then we have some great specialists. It's going to be interesting to see how this all gets together, and we're just six days away from the opener at Husky Stadium. 12.30 kickoff. It's on national television. Of course, we'll recap it the following morning on Husky Highlights with Jim Lambright. A KCPQ and Burger can want to send you to a Husky game this season. It's the great Husky ticket giveaway. And all you have to do is stop by a participating Burger King restaurant, fill out an entry blank, mail it to us by Thursday of each week, then watch Husky Highlights with Jim Lambright Sunday morning at 10 on Q13 to see if you've won. This week's winner is Bill Sata of Seattle. Congratulations, Bill. You'll be watching the Huskies and the Stanford Cardinal next Saturday at Husky Stadium. From your friends at Burger King and KCPQ. A longtime strength of Husky football teams have been the special teams, and this year will be no different given the return of the King Specialists. Travis Hansen shook off an injury-plagued sophomore season to earn all Pac-10 honorable mention honors as a junior. He now owns the Rose Bowl records for career field goals, 5, and points, 26. Hansen was perfect on PH last year 
and was 10 of 13 on field goal attempts. Senior Jason Crabb improved dramatically during spring drills and is in a battle with Hanson for kickoff duties. Punter John Wardell began his career at Washington as a quarterback. He's made a greater impact with his foot. And while some better averages, Wardell made his reputation by pinning opponents deep in their own territory. He's been blocked just one time in 100 career attempts. Well, you return a punter this year who had a fabulous season a year ago and probably didn't get as much uh, credit and the accolades that he deserved. Uh, John Wardell is uh, an outstanding punter, very poised, uh, just an outstanding athlete also, uh, runs real well, real well with the ball and uh, could, uh, could end up giving us some tools uh, as far as uh, trick plays. At trick plays? You're already talking about trick plays? Yeah, I love trick plays. And as a defensive coach, I know what it causes you in wasted practice time in trying to stop all these wonderful offensive uh, inventions. So I can hardly wait to get together with Jeff Woodruff and come up with special things for game day. Bill Walsh, did you hear that? <laughs> at, at any rate, let's move on and talk about your, your place kickers. You've got Travis Hansen and Jason Crabb, and we understand they've had quite a, a good battle during the fall camp. It, uh, we're blessed with, with two. They've, uh, Jason Crabb uh, did all of our kickoffs uh, two years ago, and, uh, uh, and Travis Hansen came on and just had a great year last year. Uh, they give us depth, uh, variety in, uh, in strengths as far as uh, strength of uh, leg and kickoff. Uh, Jason Crabb uh, is going to be hard for Travis Hansen to beat out, uh, but Travis is so accurate with the field goals. And return specialists, uh, always a, a very a bright spot on this football team, and you've got a, a couple of dandies this year. Well, okay, Bino Bryant and Napoleon Kaufman should scare people to death, and we will use them a lot together. Still to come on our Husky Highlights preseason special, a visit with Don James, and a look to next week's season opener with the Stanford Cardinal. First, the answer to today's Husky trip question. On balance, the Pac-10 Conference may be at its strongest in years. Here's a look at what's ahead for the Washington Huskies during the 1993 season. Four Pac-10 teams reside in the preseason writers and coaches polls, and most think Arizona is an odds-on favorite to make its first run for the Roses. The confidence that we gain, plus just the experience of going through the, the Rose Bowl race and, and falling short, should all help us be more mature in our outlook. And, and uh, I think we've got a good level of determination plus uh, a realistic idea of what it takes. Desert Swarm is back. The Wildcats have perhaps the finest defensive player in the conference in senior noseman Rob Waldrop. Many compare his work ethic to that of Steve Entman. And barring injury, Waldrop is a certain All-America. The Southern California Trojans are expected to rebound as John Robinson begins his second term as head coach. We have got something to prove. This is a, a senior football team that had difficult times the last two years, and they want very much to have their senior year something special. If Arizona's Waldrop isn't the best defensive player in the Pac-10, then SC and Willie McGinnis is. He passed up the NFL to play for Robinson. It was a big, big decision for me to come back, and I didn't come back just to, you know, come back as a 6-5 and five team or whatever. I came back because I, I, we wanted it all. We wanted to take it all. And they could if quarterback Rob Johnson and wide receiver Johnny Morton played catch often. UCLA suffered through an injury-riddled 1992 campaign. Terry Donahue lost 18 regulars last year and went 0 for October. I think that, that we have a chance to be pretty physical. I think we have a chance to be pretty athletic. Uh, I'm hoping that our offensive line can do a good job of protecting our quarterbacks and keeping us out of the injury riddle situation we got into last year. Washington State returns nine starters on defense from a team that won nine games a year ago. Anthony McClanahan is receiving all coast attention. Biggest question in Pullman is who will replace the Patriots' first round draft pick? His name is Mike Pattinson. He's not Drew Bledsoe, he's a different style, a different type of quarterback. But I think he'll be, end up being one of the outstanding quarterbacks in the league. I really do. He's, he's a real good player. He's only got one year left, but he's going to be an excellent player. What makes the Pac-10 scary this season is its talents. Arizona State, Oregon, Oregon State, and California could all jump out of the second division. If you look at the conference, everyone's going to be better. I, I don't see anybody, you know, whether, whether we fit where we finish, I, uh, 
you, you can't tell. You know, we're not fortunate. We're better football teams. You don't know how you... It, it kind of depends on who improves the most in that second level of teams. I see it a great race. I see it maybe um, the same kind as last year where maybe the champion has two losses. I see uh, maybe there being no clear-cut team that everybody says, hey, this is dominant team. Jim, your thoughts on the conference race this year? There's so many teams. Uh, really looking at, at Stanford uh, finishing so strong last year. Uh, uh, such a strong Arizona team uh, under Dick Tomey. Uh, combined two, uh, two Southern California schools uh, uh, and a, a rebuilding program uh, with John Robinson there at USC and uh, some team problems uh, at UCLA that certainly would have to be solved before they would be considered a major threat. Uh, there has been a lot of growth in terms of strength on the balance of this conference. It's much stronger than it was a year ago. Oh, it is from uh, from top to bottom uh, a conference that uh, you wouldn't want to have a lot of money betting on uh, on the season to begin that now and and take a big guess at who's going to win the whole thing and, and where the distribution is going to be. Another testimony to the fact that week in and week out, this may be the toughest conference in America to coach in. Uh, the toughest conference to coach in, the best offenses, the most innovative defensive uh, uh, teams, and, uh, and certainly kicking game being uh, such a major part of, uh, of all the team successes. Next Saturday afternoon, the Huskies will open it up against the Stanford Cardinal right here in Husky Stadium. A look at Bill Walsh and the Cardinal is coming up next, but first, here's the USA Today CNN Coaches Poll for this week. The Washington Huskies and Stanford Cardinals shared the Pac-10 Conference Championship last year, but based upon the Husky victory over the Cardinal, Washington presented the conference in the Rose Bowl. Stanford returns a team with high expectations for 1993 under second-year head coach Bill Walsh. I'm not sure this year will be a banner year at Stanford. We graduated 25-odd seniors, and they were really the key players on our team. Glenn Milburn, uh, Ron George, and John Lynch, these kind of people you don't replace. That may just be a curve from Bill Walsh, whose team is ranked 15th by the riders and coaches going into 1993. They returned six starters on offense, most notably back Steve Stenstrom, who's passed for over 4,000 yards during his career. Just four starters returned on a defense that helped win 10 games a year ago. We're not going to be noted as a great defensive team this year. Uh, we're going to have to score more. We should score more. Uh, and we're going to have to be swallowed giving up a few more points this year. So. It'll be more of a typical Stanford program where we score and hope the other team doesn't stay with us. Walsh irritated the Huskies with comments made to Stanford boosters in Sacramento last May. He accused Washington of running an outlaw program and called the players mercenaries. The Huskies are downplaying it. Great thinkers sometimes say things that, without thinking, if you can understand what I'm saying. I mean, Bill's, you know, he's great. He's a great coach. Uh, you know, the only thing I can say is, you know, it takes one to know one, I guess. <laughs> I mean, there's not really any, any kind of snappy remarks that we can say back to him. You know, I'm sure he said he apologized, and I'm sure he's sorry, but that's true deep down inside what he really felt about our program. It's unfortunate because it's not true. The talk is just talk. You know, that's preseason, and that's hype for the game. But when you're on the field, there's just 22 men out there looking for execution. Well, Jim, your thoughts on the Stanford Cardinal? Oh, right away, you're, you're Bill Walsh. You're uh, a great offensive uh, game plan uh, a returning quarterback in Stenstrom uh, and lost uh, their backfield, uh, uh, looking to replace some some real specialists uh, in those positions and at wide receiver, but coming back with a huge, strong offensive line. Little re little uh, repair needed in the in the dents, but uh, I think overall uh, uh, will be a, a real attractive offensive team. Your defense is going to get a real test from Stenstrom in the in the first go. Exactly. There uh, there will be nothing that uh, Bill Walsh will uh, pull off in this game. I guarantee you. It's uh, six days away now. Twelve thirty kickoff at Husky Stadium. Now coming up next, our interview with Don James. He talks about his decision to retire and about this year's team. My decision was based strictly on the addition of the of the second year of Bull Band. Don James retired at Washington last Sunday, just hours after learning of the Pac-10 sanctions against the Husky football program. 
Much has been written and said about his decision in the past week. An opportunity for you now to hear from the 18-year coach of the Husks on how he reached his decision, what his plans are for the future, and what his thoughts are about this year's football team. I knew what was going on and where it was going on, and I, I gave Barbara my number, and she wanted to call me Saturday night. And uh, it was right before we were ready to sit down to dinner, and, uh, and when I got that word, it was, uh, it was like making a call with the 25-second clock going in a critical game, and you have to make a critical call. And, and, and some you're not sure if you made a good call. Uh, there are other times that you say, we've got the best call up there. And uh, I, I made the call that uh, I could no longer go on if, if that were the case Sunday morning. And so I made it right then instantaneously. And I went out and I told the family. And uh, uh, as disappointed as they were, uh, their disappointment was, was for the players and the fact that they would, we would have two years where they could not compete in postseason play from a standpoint of, of trying to win a championship. A lot has been written, a lot has been said, uh, both uh, applauding and, and critical of your decision to retire. Well, it's interesting that the people that criticize me, I could care less about. They're, they're not important people, and I don't have much respect for them. So uh, if, if you're talking about the two media people. Don, some have suggested that a power struggle existed between the athletic department and upper campus. Did that have any bearing on your decision to step down? My decision was based strictly on the addition of the, of the second year of bull ban. Mm -hmm. The sanctions uh, ended the last 10 months. How stressful was that process on you? It, it's been no secret that you've you had some health problems a couple of years ago. How much did health play into this factor? Well, health didn't play in at all. There were a lot of sleepless nights, but a lot of people have those kind of problems. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I could just uh, challenge anyone that, that lived any place in the world that, uh, that had, a, uh, had the, the basic problems that that we had, and I'm not accusing uh, of, of outside agencies to try and you know to stir things up or create things to a point, but uh, we had we had some negative publicity that we probably deserved, and uh, then uh, we had a, uh, a newspaper and uh, and reporters that elected to do everything they could to damage me and, and, and assassinate my character, and uh, and they worked hard at it, and they 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 did things unethically, uh, as well as things that they were allowed to do under the uh, state laws of. Uh, of being able to basically look at, at all records. And uh, so that, that's what was really the most disturbing thing. Did that hurt the most? Oh, of course it hurt. And every time they would uh, publish another report, uh, uh, a little bit of it might have been true, but most of it was probably not and inaccurate. And, uh, and in, in a couple of cases, unethical. So uh, that, was, you know, that was the tough part of trying to get through all of this. Hindsight being 2020, should the university have defended itself in a different fashion than it did? I mean, they were very open and candid about uh, self-scrutiny and uh, and very cooperative in the effort. Should they have? I, I don't. I don't want to second guess the university. Uh, we spent a lot of money. I don't think we got a lot out of it. <laughs> You've spent a lot of years in leadership positions with the NCAA, and given your stature as a, a past president of the American Football Coaches Association, where do you see the game ten years from now? Uh, there have been a lot of changes in the game since you uh, got involved in coaching. Where is this game headed? I think uh, probably two of the uh, <clears throat> two of the problem areas that. Uh, Will, will no doubt impact the game and will impact all college sports. Uh, number one is, uh, is cost containment. Uh, uh, you know, sports have no, they're no different than any other, any other household. We have budgetary problems and it's hard to make ends meet. And, and, uh, and, and that is, is tied together, I think, with gender equity. That uh, a number of years ago, uh, a Title IX was passed by the federal government to, to allow uh, female athletes an opportunity to compete. And, and nobody can argue with that. I mean, I don't think there's any question. but. I think now we've got a, a group of women activists that are, are crossing the line and are, are doing things to, to maybe, maybe get us someplace where it's, it's really going to be harmful. I would wish that, uh, uh, that, like say, some of the female activists would, uh, would back off of it. I, I just don't think it makes much sense, at least to me, to, to, to work out an equation with the football budget in there. And uh, mm -hmm. if, if, you could, if they could just figure out a way to take the football budget out, uh, you know, females do play the sport of football. In, in a lot of cases, football is the, the major generator of, of income in the department. And, and obviously, some places, basketball is, is, is better or bigger, but uh, uh, those two sports. But uh, I, I think if it could just work out a deal to, to, to work on the finances and the numbers and the coaches and the salaries between all sports and just somehow take football out of the equation, it would, uh, I think they could get there a lot quicker. Games. Favorite game? Well, I, I think... Uh, you know, the start in the, my third year of my four-year contract, which means that, you know, if we'd have kept playing uh, the way we started out in, in uh, 77, I would have probably been selling some product 
uh, other than coaching, but uh, uh, I think the Oregon win got us started. Had a couple of great comebacks, you know, the, the Cal game uh, down there, the Stanford game, uh, when things start working very well and started to go back, you know, the 17 0, then 17 7, 17 14. Momentum appeared to be on the Stanford side, and, and we had one of the greatest quarters of football I've ever had. I, I think the fourth quarter against Stanford in 1977 would be my favorite quarter. Everybody got in the end zone, it seemed. We scored in punt returns, interceptions, uh, did everything we could. And the, then the Rose Bowl is would probably that first Rose Bowl against Michigan. Because you know we were underdogs, uh, we were Cinderella, if there ever was a Cinderella team. We, we needed a, you know the out of a USC-UCLA game, another game to come our way. And, uh, and to win that game was, uh, was just a great, great thrill. You won a national championship at Washington. Uh, you accomplished uh, things that many coaches aspire to. Uh, was there anything you weren't able to accomplish when you were at the university? Yeah, I think the one thing is I didn't get to go out the way I wanted to. <laughs> mm -hmm. Be the only thing. You know, we, the, the success that we've enjoyed, and uh, and again, uh, it's a real credit to the, to the just the great athletes and, and their their work ethic and the coaches that we've had. How do you be remembered at Washington and and, and as a football coach? Brings up a good point, and that's, that's one of the great disappointments uh, of mine in, uh, for the actions of the Pac-10. Is it just appeared as though, uh, you know, they, they said uh, we did not have any major violations, that we, we, we didn't sanction any coaches. Uh, and uh, it, it just it looked as if, you know, they, they tainted uh, my career and my character with their decision, and also my coaches. And uh, that was extremely discouraging. I've, I'm getting a lot of fan mail and I'm getting a lot of great letters that maybe ought to be saved and printed, but uh, uh, that's the way I wanted to be, uh, be recognized as a, as a coach that just basically gave everything he had and tried to do it the right way and, and, and had some success doing it the right way. What do you want to say to the fans? Well, I can say a lot. Uh, I, I can thank them for three days of constant phone calls and the, and the kind words that we've received and, the, and, and they're just hundreds and hundreds of letters and they're letters that I, I can never answer, uh, but just uh, uh, it's just incredible the uh, the outflow of uh, uh, kindness, tenderness, uh, support, and uh, Carol and I feel like uh, you know we are still a part of this community and this university, and, and we feel like uh, we belong, and, and we still want to make an impact. Uh, not you know not on the football team, and we'll help if we can, but uh, basically on the community because we've taken a lot out of this community. Your distinguished career now over at Washington, and you've. Uh left the helm to a guy by the name of Jim Lambright, whom you're most familiar with. He received a, a four-year contract yesterday. Uh, your thoughts about uh, Jim Lambright and, and how he will take this program, uh, hopefully, to the next level. You've taken it to a very high level. Well, you know, I, as I've said, I didn't think there's anybody more qualified to coach the University of Washington football team right now than Jim Lambright. I don't, I don't think that Joe Paterno would be or Bo Schembechler. Uh, I just think that, that Jim you know, he has been so much a part of this university, and even the success we've had. He's been involved with every decision we've made for almost 19 years. He, he's been personally involved with recruiting a lot of the great athletes. Probably if you looked at the athletes he recruited, he would have definitely more his his ledger than any other coach in the last 18, 19 recruiting classes. So uh, he's qualified, uh, he's capable, he's deserving, and, uh, and, and we have a great staff, and I think that, uh, that this staff can just keep things going without many problems at all. Well, Jim, Don James obviously feels he's left the program in very good hands under your leadership. Well, Don was an excellent coach to learn under. He was a coach who coached the people under him. That was his point of pride. Uh, that, uh, he took notes on us during practice and, and improved, improved us as a staff. Uh, hopefully from that, uh, I will just match the lessons that I've learned from him uh, in with my own personality and, uh, and be able to uh, carry on a tradition uh, of Jim Owens and, and Don James into uh, an era now that uh, that we're ready to jump even with these penalties into uh, into showing people we will be an exciting football team. You mentioned last Sunday during the news conference that this was uh, as if it were a death in the family. How has your your ball club dealt with this throughout the past seven days and, and tried to keep the focus on football? We gave them time to to hurt. We needed time as a staff to uh, to recover from uh, the extreme uh, shock of, uh, of the penalty itself uh, to our football team, uh, the Terza Bull ban, and the loss of a head coach that, uh, that brought each of us here uh, uh, to be joined on this football team. And so after the, the period of a day or so had gone by, uh, we readjusted. Uh, I feel we've well focused. Uh, the players are together. 
and uh, I think we have a thing going now that people will be proud of. And I well imagine that uh, the four captains gave you a lot of help in that process. We can't get away without mentioning uh, their names today. No, I have been blessed with uh, four wonderful captains, uh, very good people who have been excellent leaders. Uh, two on offense, uh, Jim Novell, our offensive center, and uh, Matt Jones, our fullback, and two on defense in Andy Mason, the outside linebacker, and Jim Fontaine, a defensive end. And they have done a great job of answering the questions in particular of young players and giving leadership to the team coming back from the shock. Has it sunk in yet? You're the head coach at the University of Washington? It uh, started to sink in in practice uh, right away when you take a look at an empty tower and I looked around and nobody was supervising what I was doing and uh, you, you realize you look around all these 75,000 seats and say hey I, I've got it now uh, we only have a short time to get this thing ready and on track and it's, uh, it's a great challenge, and I have a really fine staff, and I think we can produce something that people will be really proud of. Well, we're delighted to be working with you, and we're looking forward to an exciting season of Husky football under your leadership. Jim Lambright, good luck against the Stanford Cardinal, the season opener, the career opener, this coming Saturday at Husky Stadium. Thank you, Keith. And we invite you to join us each Sunday morning at 10 here on Q13 for Husky Highlights with Jim Lambright. It's a complete recap of each game with comments from the coach and your telephone calls to the head coach of the Huskies. See you next Sunday morning at 10. For Jim Lambright, I'm Keith Chipman. Thanks for joining us.